It's the Brian Lair Show on WNYC. Welcome back, everybody. I'm Matt Katz, keeping the seat warm for Brian today. Now we continue our WNYC Centennial Series called 100 Years of 100 Things. We are up to thing seven, 100 Years of New York Baseball. So right now we're going to be talking about baseball history and how it intertwines with New York City history. We're at one of those blissful moments right now in New York baseball where both clubs are in playoff contention. If the season ended today, the Mets and Yankees would actually both earn a wild card spot in the playoffs. But that's just a snapshot in time. Journalist and historian Kevin Baker's new book, The New York Game, Baseball and the Rise of a New City, tells us about the pre-Mets, even pre-Yankees history of baseball in the city. It also lays out the case that New York is the beating heart of baseball, where the game was not necessarily invented, but certainly refined and defined and carved into America's pastime. Kevin, hi. Thanks for coming on to talk about your book. Thanks for having me, Matt. Listeners, does your personal history with New York baseball go back... Maybe not 100 years, but close. (laughs) Maybe just a few decades. Give us a call to share stories about your family's baseball fandom and your connections to the Mets, Yankees, Brooklyn Dodgers, New York baseball giants. Give us a call to share your oral histories of New York baseball fandom. 212-433-WNYC. 212-433-9600. Nine two. You can also text your stories to the same number, 212-433-9692. Okay. okay, Kevin, let's get this out of the way real sure. quick. Was baseball invented in New York, or at least New York State, as, we've, as many of us grew up to believe? <laughs> baseball as we know it uh, today was invented in New York City. The old story was that it was invented up in Cooperstown by Mm -hmm. Abner Doubleday, uh, who was sort of the Forrest Gump of uh, the 19th century. Uh, Abner Mm -hmm. Doubleday was everywhere. Anything was going on. He was at Fort Sumter, was almost hit by the first shot of the Civil War, fired the first shot back for the Union, uh, was at Gettysburg, was at the Gettysburg Address, went to the White House to attend seances with Mary Todd the Lincoln. Uh, wow. He was a bibliophile, uh, a theosophist, used to correspond with Ralph Waldo Emerson, but he did not invent baseball. <laughs> and in fact, that's so much of a lie that somebody who's not in the Hall of Fame in Cooperstown is Abner Doubleday. Um, the, uh, the, the, he probably was named the founder of it in part because of this committee kind of rigged by A.G. Spalding of Sporting Goods fame. Spalding and his wife were also, uh, theosophists and that's probably why they put him in, which is why, which to me is hysterical. It's as if tomorrow a bunch of Scientologists replaced Dr. Naismith as the founder of basketball with uh, L. Ron Hubbard. But it has no no real bearing in life. Um, really, so, the, the version, you know, people have played bat and ball games since we got down from the trees. Yeah, and the first, right. the, really, the, the New York game is what we think of as baseball today. And so was it, so people were playing a game and then New York did just kind of refined it and professionalized it or oh. really like came up with almost all of the rules that we see today that all happened in New York City yeah that really evolved in New York you had these very different variations you had a uh, game in Philadelphia a Philadelphia game where you hit the ball with something called a delil you can imagine how that would have gone over in Brooklyn you know give me the delil <laughs> Uh, you know, uh, you had the Massachusetts game where you hit people, you had to hit people with the ball to get them out. Uh, you didn't have any foul or fair territory and you could run to first or around the bases, however you wanted to. Uh, it sounds like a lot of fun, but it's kind of like a Looney Tunes cartoon. I don't know how you put a stadium around that. 
Uh, my really nine-year-old the... would have liked that version of the baseball <laughs> exactly. game. Yeah. Exactly. I think a lot of nine-year-olds would have loved it. But you couldn't put a stadium around that. The, the sport as we know it, uh, with uh, nine innings, three outs to an inning, established batting order, and a hardball, uh, all evolved in New York and became known as the New York game or the New York rules. And uh, this is this is where it began. Uh, back really before the Civil War in the 1850s, uh, that was uh, that was the the game we came to know and love. And its heart has always been New York City. And the first bona fide baseball team was the New York Knickerbockers Baseball Club. Is that the am I getting well, that full name right? There were a, quite a there were a bunch of early teams, and nobody's sure mm-hmm. exactly who was first. I mean, there was the Gotham or Washington team in those days when something was first. They were often called the Washington, so they may have been the first. There was the New York Club, the Eagle Club, the Magnolia. There were tons of clubs in Brooklyn and in New Jersey, but the Knickerbockers, <laughs> excuse me, uh, thanks to their shortstop, a guy named Doc Adams, were the ones who first started. Uh, sort of codifying the new rules, writing this down, making this into the New York game. Got it. I mean, the the factoids in this book will keep any massive <laughs> baseball fan like myself just, you know, hooked and 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 you know, you know, wanting to share all the little <laughs> the facts you share. I mean, New York at one point had five baseball teams: the curveball, bunt, stolen base, all invented in New York. Yes. Yep. First All-Star game, first World Championship, all happened in New oh, York. Yes. First World Championship played between Manhattan and Brooklyn, which for New Yorkers, of <laughs> course, is, you know, what else, what other world <laughs> the whole is world. it? Um, well, but really, New York, New York really had far and away the best players. They went out, you had this great Cincinnati Red Stockings team, the first openly professional team. They were comprised almost completely of transplanted New York and Brooklyn players. Uh, the two cities being the two boroughs being two different cities then. Mm-hmm. Uh, but you had, yeah, you had 1890 with the players strike fascinating year. The players went and formed their own league. And that's when you had five teams in the city, uh, two of them playing right back to back against each other at the polo grounds. Uh you know, then you had these huge championship runs of teams like the Giants, teams like the Yankees and the Dodgers, of course, um, which really came to exemplify the sport. There, there are some wonderful New York baseball characters in your book. Uh, <laughs> okay. I would love for you to tell us about Henry Chadwick of Brooklyn, this this sports writer who really ushered in our obsession with statistics in this game. I mean, there, there's you can't have baseball without stats today and he's kind of the one who was the grandfather of that oh yeah henry chadwick was going to really break down baseball play by play statistically and that is a huge attraction of the game americans love statistics you know this is how we we kind of started american capitalism we uh you know time time work management uh we're always recording everything trying to break i think it comes from being on this enormous, seemingly endless continent and looking at this and thinking, okay, how are we going to do this? How are we Mm going to make this work moving into the industrial age? And I think baseball reflects that. And Chadwick really initiated that. He gave us the box score, which is a wonderful uh, way of recording the game, wonderful thing to look at, just perfect little measure of each game. Uh, He had various wacky notions. He was very pompous and thought baseball should be played in certain ways. For instance, he decried the home run, which he felt took up too much energy from players and (laughs) was kind of this big flashy thing. And uh, he didn't like that. More singles. Um, You know, he, he really overrated the batting average, which has sort of been debunked by the generation of sabermetrics and Bill James. Um, but he was somebody who helped organize it too and push it on. And he would, uh, he would go and umpire a game before the season began out in Brooklyn to, um, to see how the, you know, various rules were working and what needed to be revised. He said he was too nervous 
to umpire a game in an actual <laughs> an actual league game. So uh, that's what he would do. But he he and and died getting pneumonia after going to to see the Dodgers play in 1908. Wow. So, uh, but yeah, he was quite a character. And he was seemed to me like something of a baseball purist. He didn't want you know the the changes even back then, and that's. That's sort of a baseball, American baseball tradition is complaining about any small changes and there being purists calling into, you know, talk radio to, to say you can't change the game. And he was doing that 100 something years ago. Oh, exactly. There was, uh, you know, I, I quote a first baseman, uh, a guy named Old Pete in, I think, in 1868. And he was saying, you know, they really don't play the game the way they did in 1858. You know, and this is the mm. first, I think, start of, uh, you know, the good old days um, that uh, I think old Pete's start was uh, decrying what had happened. Everybody always thinks the old days were better. Yeah, sometimes they were, sometimes they were in one way or another. But uh, it's amazing how much you can still compare the game today to what it was 100, 150 years ago, compared to something like football or basketball, where the size of the athletes has made that uh, kind of meaningless. It's the Brian Lair Show on WNYC. I'm WNYC reporter Matt Katz filling in for Brian. We are continuing our WNYC centennial series called 100 Years of 100 Things. And so we're talking to journalist and historian Kevin Baker about his new book, The New York Game, Baseball and the Rise of a New City. Let's go to the phones and talk some ball. Lars in Brooklyn. Hi, Lars. Hi, good morning. Uh, my grandfather was uh, born and raised in the Bronx. His name was Gard Del Savio. He uh, had yeah. a long career, mostly in the minors, with the Yankees farm teams and some other teams as well. But he started and hmm. ended his career playing semi-pro baseball for a team yeah. called the Brooklyn Bushwicks. That was in oh, Highland yeah. Park, Queens. And uh, they had night games at this place called Dexter Park. And I know he would yeah. talk about the games, how they were televised on television, the early days of television in the early 50s. But he also did it in the 1930s when he started his career. And then when he ended, he went back to playing as a ringer mm. at these teams. And I was wondering <laughs> if your guest had, had mentioned of these semi-pro teams that were playing in the boroughs at the time. Cool. Yes, I, I do mention them. Yeah, and, and Bushwick, uh, Dexter Park. Uh, yes, and that was also one of the parks where one of the many so-called uh, Negro League teams had to play in uh back in the day but uh yes there new york has a wonderful tradition of that too and from the very start you had all these different uh teams being played by people in different professions there were teams made up of of policemen of firemen of uh of milkmen of uh eye doctors uh who formed their own clubs and uh and played against each other and that's uh that's a great part of the New York tradition too. I, I'm not sure if there are so many industrial leagues left today, but you do see a lot of uh, terrific play just going to the parks and looking at guys playing from, uh, you know, in Central Park or elsewhere. Yeah. Um, just on an amateur level, it's it's great to see. Hey Lars, was your uh, what what did you, job other than baseball did your grandfather do? Uh, well, my grandfather on the off season usually worked for the Department of Sanitation or for the post office because you couldn't make yeah. enough money doing playing the game. And um, he actually uh, continued, like like uh, you mentioned, uh, he played for the Department of Sanitation's uh, mm -hmm. industrial team once he quit baseball professionally. And there's actually wow. a photograph that we have in our family of him rounding third base at Yankee Stadium because they would have exhibition games for the regular games. Yeah. And um, yeah. also... I know that he would tell stories, you know, back then it was the segregated, segregated days of baseball, but right, a lot right. of times when he played in the Southern League or sometimes locally, he would play, he would be on a white team, he, uh, but he would play against uh, Negro League, League teams. So he, I remember one time I asked him, I said, was Satchel Paige as good as they say he was? And he <laughs> said he was better. He could like <laughs> yell out that he would about to pitch and they would still just whiff when he would go across the plate. Oh well, yeah, he was cool. a he was a great performer and a great player. Incidentally, my father was also uh, uh, born and raised in the Bronx and, and worked for the post office. But um, yeah, Paige was a great player. And there was a lot of play between these, uh, the Negro League teams and white teams, a lot of exhibition play. Uh, the Negro League teams more than held their own. 
uh they were uh, tremendous players who we all miss you know and uh we all uh that the mainstream america missed seeing um you know like new york city itself baseball was very uh, early on a melting pot or a kind of gorgeous mosaic if you will and one in which um almost everybody could meet and work and play together in the stands as well as on the field that was one of the great things about it a very democratic mix and very mm -hmm. much like the city but that almost is also crucial because it's another one of the great tragedies in this country particularly for for people of color but also for everybody that we didn't get to see these great um great african-american players uh they were they were systematically very early on uh excluded from the sport and you had up to 1884 you had uh, i'm sorry up, up to 1898 you had 55 players known black players playing in the minors or the majors mm -hmm. the so-called organized baseball but then they were just absolutely excluded and you know this was terrible and uh you had yeah. it, it's in new york in the 1910s, for instance, you had this great team, the Lincoln Stars, one of the best baseball teams ever assembled. And they were forced to play in places like the Olympic Field at 136th and 5th or the Lenox Oval at 145th and Lenox. Just really sandlot conditions, these mm -hmm. kind of rugged, rock-strewn fields. Um, later, you had the Cuban Stars who uh, built their own uh, park at uh, the Dykeman Oval. Uh, but this was uh, sort of the edges of the city that these amazing players, some of the best in the history of the game, were uh, were forced to, were marginalized in. Wow. Uh, let's go back to the, the phone lines. Uh, Michael in Beth Page. Hi, Michael. Thanks for calling in. Uh, hi. It's uh, it's terrific listening to, to the uh, guest uh reiterate the history of baseball in New York. My story uh, is more current. Uh, I okay. was a 10-year-old uh, a growing, mm -hmm. growing up in the Bronx in 1957, 58, no. when it was announced that the Dodgers were going to leave New York, <laughs> leave Brooklyn, <laughs> and go to uh, L.A. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, I became a Dodger fan, although I grew up in the Bronx because my father and I had a very difficult relationship and he was a New York <laughs> Giants fan. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> he keep, uh, he keep berating the bums from Brooklyn. So I became a Dodger fan. And of course <laughs> I took a lot of heat from my Yankee friends in the Bronx, at least until 1955 when we finally won our first world world championship. And then they moved uh, several years later, and of course it was very disheartening, but I remained a Dodger fan, even though they moved mm. to L.A., because the team was essentially the same. My heroes were just in a different mm. city, and I guess I, I recognized at that time why they moved. It, 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 mm. Unfortunately, it was all about money and building a new stadium and having enough parking, and there were powers that uh, controlled these things in New York at that mm. time. I think it was Robert Moses who just wouldn't let them build a new stadium where they wanted to in Brooklyn, and, and they couldn't get the, the city to cooperate. And, of course, from a financial perspective, it was a fabulous move for the Dodgers, and the Giants followed them. And yep. it's a shame, really, that we lost those two teams. But I am now, while I am still a Dodger fan, my heart my heart strings uh, uh, go out to the Mets because of Raising my son, my son became a, a, an instant Met fan when he was old enough to understand the game. Nice, that's uh, that's uh, great, Michael. I uh, I had a, a similar uh, relationship with my father. Uh, he was an old New York Giants fan, born on Fordham Road, and the Giants were sort of the Irish team in the city for many years. Uh, <laughs> they were gone by the time I came around, and. Uh, growing up, I, I became a Yankees. The Yankees were in last place. This is 1966. They weren't very good, but they were my team. We moved to Massachusetts, which was a wonderful place to grow up. But I was a Yankees fan. There. Everybody's a Red Sox fan. And my father started rooting for the Red Sox. So this was, you know, to me, this was terrible. Like, not only were all my classmates against me, but my father as well. So I think there's a lot of history of fathers and sons. But on the other hand, the best times we ever had together were going to uh, Fenway Park to see games. 
Um, this book goes through 1945, but right. there is a second book that is done and will be out oh. in the spring of 2026. And that gets into the whole reasons for the Dodgers and Giants moving. And yeah, there's a whole debate going back and forth between who was worse, Walter O'Malley, who was, whose fault was it, Walter O'Malley's or Robert Moses, which mm -hmm. is sort of like, you know, King Kong versus Godzilla, two of the arch villains in New York history. I put the blame still on Walter O'Malley. That was just not heard of at the time to uh, take public land and public monies and give mm -hmm. them to a baseball team and or any sports team to keep them in a city. And I think Moses was right not to do that with the uh, Dodgers and Giants. And I think it's become a terrible thing we've done since in all these cities. I mean, the Yankees latest stadium, yeah. you know, the, the other day, uh, Hal Steinbrenner was uh, saying how um, he felt the Yankees payroll was unsustainable. And I felt like saying, you know, how many free stadiums does your uh, family want? <laughs> Where they're up to right. two, you know, the, the right. current Yankee Stadium, they got one point two billion dollars in Incredible. in subsidies. You know, here in a city where we say we don't have any money to improve the the transit system, right? This is this is absurd, and uh, I think this is one of the few things Moses was right about was trying to uh, was trying to stop this. I mean, the 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 power brokers and the baseball teams have always sort of intertwined and i mean regardless of the era in new york and that's i think what you what you get to in the in the book in so many respects uh before i let you go we have four, and i can't wait to see the second book i'm glad that's coming yeah, out yeah. but before i let you go i have to talk about my team the mets i yes, always knew yeah. there was an earlier incarnation <laughs> of the mets the metropolitan or the metropolitans in the yes, 1880s yeah. But I did not know they once played very briefly on, on Staten Island. And you also yeah. wrote that they displayed the underdog spirit even in that <laughs> incarnation. Yeah, the, the, the Met or the Mets were the first New York team to make a World Series back in the 19th century. Uh, unfortunately, huh. they were owned by the same guy who owned the Giants in, a, in the other league. So he moved the best players there to the Giants oh, and sold the team. And they moved out to Staten Island. And you could get the guy running the, the ferry out to Staten Island. You could get a ticket and a Staten Island ferry ticket uh, for one price, one low price, and go there. And in 1886, you could go and see the Statue of Liberty going up just outside the park, you know, from the from the through the outfield. And yeah, what a great thing. But somehow the team still did not make it. Uh, but it is great in that uh, there has been a major league team in every borough of New York. Yeah. And just to yeah. just to say one more thing with this too about sure. WNYC's hundredth anniversary, and then the, the second book, uh, the first words of the text are literally the old WNYC tagline, uh, and I guess still the tagline, which is uh, WNYC, the radio station of the city of New York, where over seven million people live in peace and harmony and enjoy the benefits of democracy. And That's this fantastic. is, uh, yeah, you add, a, you add a million or two people, it's the same thing. So, um, you yeah. know, I don't know how peaceful and harmonious we are, but we do get on and, and we why, enjoy the benefits of democracy. Yep. And why, why is that the opening line of the book, of the new book? Oh, because that starts in 1945 and that era right after kind of what's considered the golden age of the city, yep. 45 to 50, when it goes from there through the present day. So, um, you know, which are also a lot of amazing moments, including the Mets, uh, yes. who are, are heavily in the second book, the modern Mets. And uh, yeah, so it's, um, you know, it's it's an incredible legacy. And I hope, uh, I hope people uh, enjoy it. Um, it's, you know, it's also even even the terrible parts, even, for instance, the, the horrible segregation in the sport. Mm -hmm. uh, there's an amazing uplifting story there, too, of what black and Hispanic players made of their time in the uh, in the Negro Leagues, yeah, fighting their endured. way into the majors and 
really kind of, uh, you know, changing the game in their own way, contributing great things to it. So yep. it's it's a change the game a, and change the city in the process. And that's uh, very, how the two very much changed each other and affected each other is is what you get to so beautifully in the book. Uh, this was thing seven in our centennial series, 100 year, 100 years of 100 things. Talking New York baseball, my guest has been journalist, historian Kevin Baker, and his current book is The New York Game, Baseball and the Rise of a New City. It goes to the middle of the 20th century, and the next one, you heard it here first, is coming out in a couple of years. Kevin, thank you so much for coming on and sharing some of these stories with us. Thanks for having me. Always great to be on WNYC.